in this interaction uh, that takes place between a, a, a person and a robot, um, the uh, the person is a critical determining factor into how that interaction is going to work. Just like with your computer, you know, if you have a very uh, low frustration tolerance, for example, computers are going to drive you crazy because computers, as we talked about a little bit, even just before we started recording, computers are always going to behave in confounding ways. They're always going to do something that you didn't expect, that you didn't want, and they will do something. Now, if I allow my low frustration tolerance to guide my interactions with my behavior with, with my with my computer that's not going to be a good relationship with my computer it's going to be a terrible relationship with my computer software isn't going to work we all know people who can't get things to work on their computer and the the computer is there to work just fine it's the human part of the interaction that isn't working well I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Tom, welcome to the Unmistakable Creative. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Oh, Srini, thanks so much for uh, inviting me. Yeah, my pleasure. So, you know, I actually came across your story by way of our mutual friend, Jenny Blake, who mm -hmm. had mentioned your name in an interview that I did with her. And she said that your work centered around the psychology of human robot interaction. And I thought, yeah, we definitely have to find out what that's all about, because um, I would have never thought such a field would even exist or uh, was even important until I realized, wait a minute, there is a lot of interaction that we're doing with technology on a daily basis, but I've never thought about the psychology of it. But uh, before we get into all of that, I want to ask you, what um, is the most important thing you learned growing up from a parent, teacher, or coach that you think has had an impact on the, the work that you've ended up doing with your life? That's a, of, of course, people say this all the time. That's a great question, Trini. Um, I, my, my father, who was a, um, uh, a, an interesting man in that he went to the fifth grade uh, in school and um, was a worker all of his life, um, somehow always found a way to put himself into positions where people relied on him. And, and I would watch as people would, people, uh, my, my father mixed cosmetics in huge vats for uh, a, a distributing company. And he did so from memory. He never wrote down the formulas. Uh, he was not very good at writing. He never wrote down the formulas that he used. He just remembered all the quantities and all the different ingredients, and he mixed them all together. And, and, I, and one day I, I was talking to him, and he said, you know, it's never a bad idea to make yourself indispensable in a job. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of laughed. I said, well, that sounds like, a, that sounds like some great advice. So um, I, I've always felt like, just as your work is focused on being unmistakable, mm -hmm. I've, I've always felt like, how do you make yourself somebody who's unique within whatever context you're in? And so that was pretty good advice from my dad. Mm -hmm. So how did that impact the choices that you ended up making with uh, your life and your career uh, later on? Well, I, I, from a young age, for you know reasons that are um, always you know, shrouded in the stories we tell ourselves about our lives. At a young age, I, I uh, decided that I wanted to become a psychologist. And um, it was intriguing to me that the, 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 the ways in which people interact with one another um, are, are endlessly fascinating and, and to some degree knowable. So when I started to study psychology, uh, this was in the um, in the mid '60s. Um, what I what I saw was that American psychology at that point was very much 
uh, very strongly influenced by behaviorism. So what we had was basically an approach to psychology that was um, based on stimulus response uh, uh, model and very little about what we actually think of as psychology, which is what what humans experience. And so I started to to, to wonder about, well, wh- who's studying this other <laughs> side of things? Not the behavior, but the experience that each of us has as living human beings every day. And what I found was that there was that there was this unique um area of psychology, kind of a humanistic, uh, at, as it was called at the time, humanistic psychology that was distinctive uh, from the mainstream. And it also was not psychoanalysis. So there was kind of, it, and it was actually called the third force movement. It was, it was a, um, a way of thinking about human experience that was neither the classic psychoanalytic model, nor was it this um, what I would always consider to be animal laboratory based behaviorism, but it was something unique. So that attracted me. And I think part of it was that it did have that distinctive um, quality to it, which also resonated very much with my belief system. Hmm. Why do you think it is that you came to the realization of the importance of being distinctive so early in your life? And yet, uh, you know, I, I think we, we all kind of recognize the value of that now, especially in the world that we live in today, but it doesn't seem like it was something that was really emphasized, at least when I was growing up. You know, I, 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 I think some of it has to do with the fact that I was uh, a distinctive child. I was the, the youngest of three in my family and significantly the youngest. My, my, my late brother was uh, – uh, almost 17 years older than me. My sister is 14 years older than me. And then I came along and I was different than my sister and my brother. I grew up in the Bronx. I grew up in a, as I, as I already uh, alluded to a, a working class family. My father went to the, uh, went to the fifth grade. My mother went to the eighth grade. Uh, she was a seamstress, worked uh, as a seamstress all of her life. And um, my brother uh, dropped out of high school, uh, ended up becoming a New York City policeman. My sister did graduate from high school, uh, but as soon as she did, she got a, little, got a job uh, working in retail and shortly afterwards got married. But I was always precocious, I guess. Uh, uh, I, I was gifted intellectually with, um, you know, an ability to do well in school. And, and so from a very early time on, I had, I had been put into, you know, the special classes for the kids who were going at the time we called it college material. Oh, this, oh, my mother would go to teacher conferences in school and they'd say, you know, Tommy is college material. And so there was this sense of being distinctive in my family um, and, you know, having this kind of unique, uh, especially in my neighborhood, having this kind of unique uh, set of abilities. My friends were were. They were smart, but they were working class kids smart. You know, they were looking to get a job. Nobody went to college. I was the, the only one in my group of friends and first in my, in my family, uh, even extended family, to go to college. So I guess there was this early sense that I was different from a lot of the people in my surroundings. Hmm. Walk me through uh, from sort of leaving high school uh, to the trajectory that leads to this work, because uh, I, you know, I, I think this is something that I'm finding more and more is that the people that I interview almost never is their path a straight and narrow one to where <laughs> they end up at, um, because you you really there's nothing that is ever put in front of you that says this is a potential career option. Yeah, that's that's certainly true in in my case. Um, as I said, I grew up in the Bronx, and and um, uh, in this neighborhood with. Very similar kinds of, of kids, although the kids who were in my, in my special, you know, in my smart kids classes, they were all going to go to college. And um, I started thinking when it was time, when, when I was deciding where I was going to go to school, go to college, um, I, I, I had won scholarships to New York State schools. And uh, I started thinking, you know, I don't want to go to a school that's anything like New York City. 
I don't want to be anywhere. I, I, the, the world is bigger than my Italian uh, uh, focused <laughs> neighborhood in the Bronx. And I had never been west of New Jersey uh, at, at the time. And uh, a friend of mine, a, a kid in my neighborhood, had gone to the University of Dayton in Dayton, Ohio. And he liked it a lot. He was a, a, a turned out that he was a junior when I was a freshman. And he said, you know, Dayton's a pretty good school. Uh, the, my parents were, as I say, working class, couldn't afford to send me anywhere really expensive. And it turned out the University of Dayton had a, uh, um, uh, a payment plan, monthly payment plan for tuition, which really worked for my parents. Uh, they could budget for my tuition. And, and Dayton, Ohio was about as far away from the Bronx as I could get at that point in time. And so um, that's where I went. I went to the University of Dayton, which was, by the way, a Catholic university. I had gone to public schools all my life in New York City. Um, and we were as I like to put it, Italian Catholics, which means, you know, not all that serious about Catholicism. My, my parents didn't go to church. I was made to uh, go to religious instructions until I uh, received the, uh, the appropriate sacraments, you know, uh, communion and confirmation. And then I could decide for myself whether to go to, to, to church. Uh, but the idea of going to a, to a Catholic school had a I don't know, a philosophical fascination for me that, hmm, you know, this could be, this is going to be interesting. It's going to be really different. So off I went to Dayton, Ohio, and it was, it was like landing on the moon. Uh, I, 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 that was my first airplane flight. Um, I wore a gray shark skin suit. Uh, it was August of 1964. It was a million degrees. And I got on an airplane and landed in Dayton, Ohio. And as the plane is coming down to land in, in the airport, I'm looking around and all I see are cornfields. And it's like, oh, where's the airport? <laughs> where's, so we land and, and um, I, I have a huge trunk and a suitcase and the, uh, the, there's a bus to take us to downtown Dayton. And downtown Dayton was amazing. It was, you know this little street, Main Street in downtown Dayton. And from there, I took a taxi uh, to my dormitory on campus. And this, I had this huge trunk and, and, and a suitcase. And the, the taxi driver uh, took the, the, the trunk and put it in the, in the back of the taxi and took my suitcase. And, you know, here we go. We go driving to campus and drive up this long hill to my dormitory. And we get there. The taxi driver takes out the 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 trunk and he carries it into the the dormitory and i i pay him the fare which was i don't know two dollars or something and i and i go to hand him 50 cents for a tip and he says that's okay no thanks and i said oh my god where am i <laughs> i just i just left new york i just landed here i tried to give a taxi driver a 50 cent tip and he said no thanks i felt like this definitely is the moon i went up to my room and i took off my shark's kid suit and i got into bed and just closed the the, the the shades and i had to i had to like reboot myself because i knew i was in some place so different and, I, and it was. It was a culture shock that I was, as it turns out, that I was hungry for. I was hungry for another way of looking at life that I, I knew existed out there but had never experienced. And so um, going to school at the University of Dayton turned out to be a great decision for me because I, I, I met there uh, a man who became my mentor um, who was a brilliant psychologist, double PhD in philosophy and psychology. And his approach to psychology was very much in keeping with this intuitive sense I had about how psychology was much more than just behaviorism and much more than just simple psycho, not simple, but much more than just psychoanalytic um, uh, thinking. It was something else that was richer and so his name was Antos Rancarello. He was a brilliant, brilliant man. And I studied with him through my undergraduate years and uh, f for two years 
Well, I got my master's uh, before I left to uh, to continue that uh, quest for an understanding of human experience as lived. As it turned out, that approach, which is called phenomenological psychology, was only taught at one school in the country for on a doctoral level, and that was Duquesne University in Pittsburgh. And so after getting my master's degree at Dayton and then teaching for a year at Dayton, while I also worked at the state hospital there in Dayton, Ohio, I was uh, um, uh, studying clinical psychology for my master's degree and worked in the state hospital from uh, 1968 to uh, 1970, which was, uh, you, you know, one of those, again, transformative experiences being in, uh, working in a, a hospital for severely mentally ill people in the late 60s was as eye-opening an experience as any person could have. I mean, uh, Dayton State Hospital at the time housed, I don't know, 5,000 patients uh, with the, the entire range of um, psychiatric disorders that exist. So I got to see humanity uh, in its fullest expression, and to have and and was learning from uh, Dr. Ancarello and others uh, uh, on the faculty was learning an approach to understanding the experience of people in even in the most. Um, extreme circumstances. So trying to understand what lived experience was like for people who were seriously mentally ill. Um, and it was, it was exhilarating. And um, that's what led to my decision to go to Duquesne. And fortunately, I was accepted uh, for a doctoral program at Duquesne University and um, continued to work in institutions for seriously mentally ill people uh, for uh, inpatient for another four years uh, before deciding that what I wanted to do as a clinician was to work with a community mental health center. So I went to work for a very, for a very rebellious group of clinicians who had formed uh, 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 in the, in the, in the sixties, uh, the, 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 the country was divided up into what became known as catchment areas. These are, um, community-based programs that deliver uh, uh, quality, we hoped, mental health services to people who, um, of all income levels, of all, uh, uh, it, was, it was based to be the, um, uh, the service delivery agency and coordination agency for people who were who had multi multi problems these were people who were who had uh you know serious mental uh, uh uh health problems they had often drug and alcohol problems often um uh problems with impulse control and abuse so working in that community agency was something i really wanted to do and so i ended up working there um for 12 years so um <laughs> that's i i I, I ended up working as a clinician, all told, working as a clinician for um, about 20 years, from the late 60s to the late 80s. Hmm. From there, yeah. <laughs> from there, things got things got even more complicated because one of the um, one of the things that happened uh, was that. I mentioned that our organization was kind of a rebellious group and the way that agencies were funded uh, uh, for mental health services back then was through uh, uh, state grants. The federal government would sit, would give money to the states, the states would give money to the counties and the counties would give money to the agencies. Our agency um, was initially formed by a group of parents of um, – uh, children with severe emotional difficulties. Most most of the agencies that made up these catchment a uh, area agencies were either hospitals or universities. Politically, they were much m much more uh, powerful than a community based agency like mine was, and so they got much higher per capita funding 
than the people in our communities. This was in the eastern suburbs of Pittsburgh. Uh, much higher per capita funding, which didn't uh, didn't sit very well with us. So my boss, who was a remarkable uh, human being, a social worker by the name of Ray Webb, um, would uh, he would rail against this political system uh, profoundly, and and would always be in Harrisburg trying to get more money for our agency. And one day came back and said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to apply directly to the federal government for a block grant so that we get directed, uh, we, we get directly funded. We will not have to go through the political process with these uh, more powerful organizations. And the people in our catchment area will be funded at the same level as people in other catchment areas. That was a, a great thing. He said that the only problem is we only have six weeks until the deadline for applying for this grant. And um, uh, that Ray was a, uh, uh, was a gadget freak from all the time that I had known him. He always had, uh, um, uh, he had had polio and so he had his car was um, uh, ad adaptively equipped with all kinds of things that enabled him to drive uh, normally, even though he had a brace on one leg and could only use one one leg uh, to drive. And so he, and he had recording devices and also anyway, he he said, we only have six weeks, but I talked to the people at Lanier, though they were, um, you know, a, a a company that made uh, digital recorders and actually not digital, but, you know, tape recording equipment. And he said, they just came out with something called a word processor. And they're going to let us use this word processor to write this grant so that we can get funded in six weeks. I said, okay, sounds great. Well, we did. Um, uh, some friends of mine and I, people who I worked with at the time, uh, used this word processor, the first word processor any, is, any of us had ever seen. This was 1979. And um, it was magic, as you know, the first time you see word processing, you know, it's like, holy mackerel, <laughs> look what you can do. So we worked 24-hour shifts of people who would be writing uh, first draft text. And then we'd have clerical people who would put the first draft into the word processor on, at that time, five and a quarter inch floppy disks. And then at night, myself and a good friend of mine, Jerry Celia, would sit there and edit. And we edited and edited and edited and, and well, ended up we got funded. This grant got funded because the, the kind of group we were, it was one of these, they told us we couldn't possibly get it done in six weeks and, you know red flags in front of bulls kind of thing. We immediately said, okay, sure, we can't get it done. And we did. We wrote a, we wrote a great grant proposal. After the proposal was accepted, our liaison officer, the guy who was helping us through the process, called up and said, hey, um, uh, how would you guys like $100,000 for an MIS? We said, oh, that's great. What's an MIS? <laughs> he said, oh, it's a management information system. It's a computer system. We said, sure, absolutely. We're going to need a computer system. My boss said, Ray said, look, you, had, you enjoyed working with that word processor so much. Why don't you head up this project of acquiring, um, getting us a, a, this management information system, computer system? And I said, okay. So I went to the Ma National Institute of Mental Health uh, Staff College for MIS and learned about computers. And this was, again, 1979, 19, going into 1980, and ended up um, acquiring and uh, using, uh, having a, a, a board staff committee to design and implement this computer system, which, which was, you know, tremendously fascinating and turned out to be a, a major turning point in my career. Uh, um, I had, because I had become kind of an administrator at the mental health system, uh, mental health center that I worked at at this point, I had also started a private practice as a clinician at night seeing patients because I, I loved doing psychotherapy, but I was now an administrator during the day. So this practice ended up being a platform that I could use when I started getting calls from other human service agencies saying, hey, you, you seem to know something about 
these computers and you know about human service, why don't you come and help us to implement a computer system? And I said, okay, it sounds great. Sounds really good. And that, that, again, that was a huge turning point in my career because I started doing uh, information system consulting, which was very much like family systems therapy <laughs> sort of at the time. You know, I mean, everybody always thought, oh, the computer is going to be a magic bullet. It's going to fix everything. Well, you know, computers are amplifiers. All they do is make big, make little problems into big problems faster, you know, especially organizational problems. And so I started really to enjoy the the, the systems approach to the organizations that I would be working with and trying to help them to create organizations that were more effective and then to e implement technology, not the other way around. So you said long answers were okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long one for sort of, th that, that was a, a major turning point in my career then. And I ended up working uh, mostly in hosp with hospitals and with, mental, uh, with human service organizations for about the next five years. Mm -hmm. Until I got sick of working in healthcare. <laughs> I, had, I had absolutely had it. I had had enough of working with healthcare. And, and, uh, and so um, my wife and I were still living in Pittsburgh at the time. And uh, my wife is uh, an occupational therapist, uh, which meant that she could get a job anywhere. And um, we said, you know, why don't we do something different? Uh, so I started to look around for organizational psychology consulting firms uh, that might take me on and found one in Chicago. So we moved to Chicago and it was there that I was first introduced to the world of business. I, I mean, except for running this not-for-profit mental health center uh, being one of the administrators of that, I had never worked in a business before. So I joined this firm, which was filled with um, uh, people with uh, organizational development PhDs and a few of us who were clinical PhDs. And I felt like I got another PhD in org psychology uh, learning from, from these people in my firm. And the experience of working in, in organizations was just, uh, it, it was exhilarating. I was flying all over the country doing things I'd never done before, working with organizations, again, around creating systems that were uh, effective and that were uh, designed around uh, uh, enhancing uh, capability and therefore enhancing profitability. So, um I stayed there in, in Chicago for about uh, almost five years and then uh, along with a colleague decided to uh, go out on my own and we started our own consulting firm. Uh, my wife and I moved to, um, most of my client work was on the East Coast and so we said, well, that's enough of that 100,000 mile a year flying stuff. Let's go, <laughs> let's move East. My, my wife had never, uh, she loved New York but had never lived in the metro area so we moved to Connecticut and um, uh, that was 25 years ago now that I started my consulting firm, which um, my now partner and I named uh, True Talk Consulting as a way of trying to signal the main feature that we believed enabled uh, uh, organizational systems to work well, which was finding a way to uh, actually speak honestly with one another about what's going on in the organization and in the business. Hmm. So I don't know about you, but vacuuming is not one of those things that I ever look forward to doing. But as you know, your environment has a huge impact on your creativity. So I still like it to be clean wherever I'm living and working. But now it doesn't have to be something that you deal with. If you're like me and you grew up in the 80s, you probably fantasized about the day when cleaning your house would be like it was for the Jetsons, meaning you don't have to lift a finger. Well, the good news is that we're already kind of living in that future. And the easiest way to make sure your floors are clean every day is with the iRobot Roomba Robot vacuum. It cleans up after itself. The clean base automatic dirt disposal takes convenience to a new level, automatically empties its own bin into an allergen lock bag that holds 60 days of debris and traps 99% of pollen, mold, and dust mites so you can forget about vacuuming for months at a time. Let the Roomba clean for you instead. It learns your home, finds dirt, and empties itself on its own. It's got powerful cleaning performance made effortless. 
Remember, if it's not from iRobot, it's not a Roomba. To learn more, go to iRobot.com slash unmistakable. Interesting. So, so many questions come from this. Um, the first one really is, what did you learn about behavioral change from working with people who are severely mentally ill? Uh, because the reason I ask that is I think even those of us who are not severely mentally ill struggle with behavior change. So I'm curious, you know, what you learned from that, that we could be, that we could be thinking about and applying to our own lives. I think the, the, the key that I learned was that, um, identifying one's prevailing perspective on the world is critical to understanding behavior. Now, you know, we never understand ourselves with perfect loose, uh, 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 transparency, right? I mean, we, there, there's all, there are unknowable aspects of the origins of our thoughts and feelings and behaviors, but the more we can, um, examine, reflect, learn to reflect on our point of view on situations, the more capable we become of intervening in what are often automatic kinds of uh, clusters, bundles of thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So this idea of, I would always kind of um, encourage the, the people that I was working with to, to, to take a look at themselves as if they were examining an object. And, and look, look at, at, at yourself from as many different angles as you can to try to understand the sequences of emotions, thoughts, and then behaviors that you find there, the patterns that you find there. Because discovering the patterns is one of the first steps to being able to intervene in changing the pattern. So that process, that reflective process, which doesn't require um, a, a lot of technical knowledge of, of, about oneself, it's just being able to, um, uh, to notice, for example, huh, you know, whenever there's more than eight people in a room, I find myself mm, fill in the blank. Wow, that's interesting to learn. Okay, how do I, do, how, is that, does that work for me? Does it, is that, has that made my, my world better? Have my relationships improved? Or are there other ways for me to behave in rooms where there are more than eight people that I would prefer? So it's that um, process of reflecting, noticing, uh, and then always, always experimenting, trying little things. Uh, I, I've done lots and lots of marriage counseling kind of work in my career and, you know, would always be encouraging couples. Well, you know, don't do it that way. <laughs> don't have that fight about who's going to clean up after dinner. You know, when you come to that moment, when you would usually have the fight, stop, take a look at one another and go, oh, this is when we usually have the fight, isn't it? And think about how else you might be able. So it's that process of, of you know, discovery and experimentation that um, ended up being a, um, uh, a methodology that I think is, is applicable in a lot of different circumstances. Hmm. Well, let's do this. Um, let's shift gears. And I, let, let's spend the rest of our time talking about what I really want to chat with you about, which is this idea of you know, the psychology of human-computer interaction or human-robot interaction. Hmm. Um, because I would never think that the relationship that I have with my computer is something that I need to consider from a standpoint of human behavior. Yeah. Uh, like that just wouldn't have ever occurred to me until Jenny mentioned what you did. And I thought, well, that is kind of crazy. Uh, but before we go right into that, I want to ask you one other question, which I think will make a nice segue into this. What did you take away from working with humans that has applied to this idea of, you know, the psychology of human computer interaction? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. The, um, uh, so in this interaction that takes place between a, a, a person and a robot, um, the, uh, the person is a critical determining factor into how that 
interaction is going to work. Just like with your computer. You know, if you have a very uh, low frustration tolerance, for example, computers are going to drive you crazy because computers as we talked about a little bit, even just before we started recording, computers are always going to behave in confounding ways. They're always going to do something that you didn't expect, that you didn't want, and they will do something. Now, if I allow my low frustration tolerance to guide my interactions with my behavior with, with my with my computer that's not going to be a good relationship with my computer it's going to be a terrible relationship with my computer software isn't going to work we all know people who can't get things to work on their computer and the the computer is there to work just fine it's the human part of the interaction that isn't working well right so with robots it's even more interesting because robots are, they're objects, but they are special kinds of objects. They are objects that have been designed to work with us on accomplishing certain tasks, right? So if I understand my approach to Let's let's talk about a um, uh, um, let's talk about a robot that's going to be in um, uh, let's say in a healthcare environment where there's going to be a robot that is going to be even just picking up linens right in the uh, uh, you know pushing around a, a, a linen cart if that robot is going to have some characteristics that are going to be human-like. We anthropomorphize objects, right? We, we ascribe human characteristics to all kinds of things, uh, all sorts of objects. Uh, certainly, we do to objects that resemble humans in any way. And as we are anthropomorphizing that object, we are essentially treating it the way we treat people, in a in, in in a certain way to a certain degree i'm using my um the same set of cognitive emotional and behavioral characteristics that repertoire that i use with other people to some degree i'm using that same repertoire in interacting with this robot so uh what i learned was that I, I, I have to back up just another half a second here and say I teach a course um, at the uh, School of Visual Arts in a master's in branding program called The Meaning of Branded Objects. And in that course, I've taught it now uh, going on seven years, in, in that course, what I have done is to, is to um, help students to understand what I call the architecture of meaning. The architecture of meaning is, is, is a way to think about how lived experience comes about. So my lived experience, the way my world presents itself to me, is a function of the way I think of, of, uh, of it as kind of three layers, which I've borrowed from information systems technology. So the way I think about it is the hardware, firmware, and software of meaning, the architecture of that meaning, is a function of, the meaning is a function of my hardware, which is my neurophysiological equipment. This is what I've, what, what we as humans share 99.8% of, right? We have, we have these systems that are uh, common to us all. We then move up to firmware, and firmware I think of as culture. So my cultural background, I grew up in the Bronx in, in, the, in the, you know, last third of the 20th century and this kind of an environment. And, you know, that's my, my cultural heritage is a, is a constituent element of the way the world presents itself to me. Finally, my software, which is really my own unique psych psychological history, 
is the third component of that meaning generating mechanism that I am in the world, right? So when I experience something in a moment, someone shows me something and I go, oh, I don't like that. That reaction is a function of all three of those layers, if you will, of the architecture of meaning, all expressing themselves in a moment because, you know, we live in a moment. We don't do the kind of, you know, uh, analytic work of, I wonder where that reaction came from. You know, no, it's just, you know, I just go, ooh, I didn't like that. Ah, you didn't like it. And if we begin to understand your hardware, firmware, and software, we might be able to understand um, something about the genesis of that meaning. In terms of, of an object like a robot, for example, if we look at the difference between, let's say, Western culture and Japan, so here we're talking about the firmware level of that meaning generating mechanism. People in Japan experience robots entirely differently than people in America do. I'm generalizing, of course, but there are great examples of um, how differently those robots, are, the, the robots, what they mean to people in Japan and what they mean to people in the West. And if we look at kind of the I don't know, the origin stories of robots, what we see is that in Japan, uh, there are centuries of um, history, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> centuries of history of, of people interacting with uh, dolls and automata that are um, lifelike and very appealing. In the West, we have Frankenstein. And, you know, we have, we have these uh, terrible uh, monsters that we create in, as, as robots. So when we look at that, at that layer, that firmware layer, and then think about the impact that that's had on our own personal psychological histories, what we see is that how we're going to react to robots is going to be very much a function of these three layers. And... When we are now about to be in a world in which we're going to be surrounded by robots of all kinds, some of them are going to be virtual, some of them are going to be physical, how we react to them, meaning how we're going to be able to utilize them effectively, is going to be a function of that meaning-generating amalgam that you know, is the hardware, firmware, software system. So what I started to do was to think about uh, in, in back another digression in my corporate consulting career i spent a lot of time with corporations trying to develop competency models now a competency model is a way of thinking about what does it take for someone in a particular job position to be successful wildly successful so for example what does a great store manager look like for a retail chain what are, the, what are the characteristics that we can look for to either select or promote people into those roles so that they can be effective? And by the way, in the retail world, a great store manager can have about a 20% sales uh, delta from a lousy store manager. So it really matters whether or not you can select and promote people who are going to be good store managers. Well, Looking at that at that idea of you know what are the, the what are the constituents of what it will take for people to be really great at interacting with robots become experts at working with robots that really got me fascinated and that started me off almost five years ago now on this on this research into uh, the literature of human robot interaction. Mm. Wow. Um. So, you know, people listening to this are probably wondering, okay, what do I do to prepare for this future that's coming? You know, what can I do to work on, you know, sort of my relationship with machines and, you know, this idea that, uh, you know, there's human robot interaction happening? How do I improve that from my perspective? Well, I think as we talked about in regard to um, behavior change um, in general, taking a step back and thinking about your... Uh, your, your unvarnished initial reactions. So when you ask people, well, what do you think about, about um, this new Amazon thing that sits in your house and that you talk to? And 
if people say, I wouldn't have one of those in my house for anything. Okay. Now that that's what I want to hear. I want to hear your first reaction to that because then what I want you to do is to begin to explore the architecture of that reaction. What is it about this thing that concerns you? What is it that you don't want to be around? Um, and, um, uh, and contrastingly, we find people who, oh, you know, bring one of those into my house immediately. Give me one of those. Give me one of those robot vacuum cleaners. Give me one. of I can't wait for the, the self-driving cars. You know, people who have that kind of a, of an initial reaction, that's telling you about your, if you will, your natural approach. That's, that's, that's kind of part of, and it's, emerging from that hardware, firmware, software package that you are that generates that reaction. Now, if you're interested in developing what I'm calling your robo-psych, if you're interested in developing that bundle of capabilities, there are areas of, um, uh, first of all, the mi- your mindset is going to be pivotal in whether or not you're going to be effective at working with any kind of a, of a uh, in any kind of a situation, but certainly at effective at working with technology like, like robots. So think about, you know, your, your, your mindset about robots. If, if you are thinking, I don't want to have one of those in my house at all, then one of the first things you might want to do is to say, okay, I have to, I have to suspend that reaction for a moment and begin now to experiment with putting myself into situations where I'm using these kinds of systems, where I'm actually interacting with this Amazon thing. Maybe I'll, you know, maybe I'll, I'll go to a friend's house who has one and see what it's like. So approach that mindset is fundamental. After that, there's a whole series of areas of knowledge and of skills and of abilities and of personal characteristics that are going to, as in any sort of a domain, are going to um, indicate whether or not you are going to be good at it. So, for example, if you if you want to um, uh, work in an area that's going to be uh, rich in robots, which we all are, with before too long, uh, then taking a step back and saying, okay. How do these things work? What do I need to know about robot systems? How do I, how do they work? What are they made up of? What you don't have to become, uh, I, I think it's very important to point out, you don't have to become a programmer to become proficient at using technology. Just like you don't need to know how to tune up your car to be an expert driver, to be an excellent driver. You are an operator of that vehicle. And there are all kinds of cognitive, emotional, and behavioral um, elements that differentiate really excellent drivers from really terrible drivers. Learning what they are, practicing them. I know you had uh, uh, Anders Ericsson on uh, on your show who is really, you know, the expert at experts. <laughs> his, his expertise is in studying experts and how experts become experts. And we are talking about domains of deliberate practice, which I, I'm now just developing the, um, the framework for being able to enable people to improve their, well, again, what I'm calling robo-psych. In, in one sense, and I, this is kind of a, um, uh, I, I feel a little, a little guilty about using this, but in a way, it's kind of like becoming a robot whisperer. You know, if you've ever seen the, the, the dog whisperer show, you know, you know that here's someone who has a special kind of interaction relationship with animals. All animal trainers have this, have this um, expertise at knowing how to interact with, with animals effectively. Part of that is technical knowledge knowing about the animal and about, and a large part of it is non-technical knowledge. It's that, that approach, that, that emotional, um, entering into the situation, how you live into that situation, that relationship will have a significant impact on how well you do as an animal trainer and how well you're going to do at working with robots. 
Well, this has been really uh, just fascinating and, and riveting. Um, so I have one last question, which I know you've heard me ask since you've listened to our interviews. What do you think it is that makes somebody or something unmistakable? Well, I, 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 you know, there's a, uh, I'm, I'm rubbing my fingers together, you know, in that kind of, uh, you know, when you feel the fabric on something, there's that, there's that sense you have when you're with someone unmistakable that this is a, this is a unique, you know, there's a uniqueness about this interaction and and you know my whole career has been about studying experience lived experience the life world and and when we are in the presence of someone unmistakable there is in our lived experience a texture a a, a rhythm a, a you know you you're looking and you're you're caught up in the interaction with this person in a way that you're not caught up in interactions with other people. And so that person, that situation becomes unmistakable. And from that, you know, from that moment on, it's like going to a great restaurant, you know, you walk into the restaurant that you've been to before and you immediately enter into the world of that relationship that you have with that, with that restaurant. And it's unmistakable. It's, it's unlike any other. So I think, it's the quality of the lived experience that we have with other people that gets us to label them as unmistakable. Hmm. Well, uh, like I said, this has been just fascinating and awesome. Where can people learn more about your work? Um, uh, Robopsych.com is the website where I have um, my um, I, I publish a newsletter. Um, I also um, have a podcast that uh, you can find on all the all the podcast networks. Um, and you can also take a look at the, I, I have to give a, a plug for the school of visual arts in New York city, our masters in branding program, where I'm on the faculty, uh, along with a, a remarkable group of people, uh, uh check that out. SVA.edu, um, uh, uh MPSB dot SVA dot MP. I always get that a little confused, but just, just Google school of visual arts, masters in branding, and you'll find us. Um, and it's a, it's a great, uh, it's a great program. Our students are remarkable people from all over the world who come to New York for one year to learn about the, um, the discipline of creating and growing brand identities. Awesome. Well, uh, like I said, uh, this has just been awesome. And I, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to uh, join us and share some of your insights and your story with our listeners. Well, thanks so much. I enjoyed it as well. Sorry. Awesome. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that next time on the unmistakable creative. Most people find a motivation that drives their work, right? Mm -hmm. And, and in some ways, the best thing that can happen to us is that we in, encounter some obstacles that test and make us think about our relationship to that motivation and our relationship to the work and that pushes us to continue working, right? It's, it's not, a, it's not a, a coincidence that, let me put it this way. If you look at most politicians who've gotten to the presidency, they had some, they had some period of deep disappointment earlier in their lives. And it's not that they become president because of that setback. It's that they have the capacity to become president. And when they encounter some type of you know, secondary setbacks, they know that they can push through it because they know that they have this genuine, passionate commitment to what the work is as opposed to just the outcome of the work. Author Charles Duhigg joins us to talk about his new book, Smarter, Faster, Better.